Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back once again to Lights and Perfection. You are here for another moment in the Word. My name is Chris. On this channel, what we try to do is bring to you the truth about biblical perfection and holiness to light through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we do that by breaking into God's Word, the Holy Bible, pulling out of it spiritual and biblical principles that you and I might apply to our daily lives to deepen, enrich, and enliven our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to cause us to become doers of his word and not just hearers only. Let's get started. Hello once again, everyone. My name is Chris. Thank you for tuning in for this segment of Moment in the Word. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about, it's a little bit different. Today, we're talking about how I study the Bible. This scripture here on the title screen is, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Hallelujah. So just a quick disclaimer. The reason why I wanted to do this is because I know that there are many people that, you know, there's many different methods and practices to studying the Bible, to gaining understanding from it. But the key thing that I wanted to highlight was getting something from God's word. You know, there's no blanket covering to any of this stuff, so I'm not doing an exhaustive resource on how to study the Bible as it pertains to everyone else, but how God led me through the scriptures to bring me to where he brought me today. And there's so much more that I want to learn and grow in. And as I do, I get to share that with you. And I think really at the heart of everything, that's what it's all about. Now, this segment here is from Moment in the Word, and I just wanted to touch on this real quick because you see sometimes I jump back and forth doing videos for real gospel for real people, and this one here is for Moment in the Word. So real gospel for real people is just really like the nitty-gritty gospel messages. Sometimes I get to share my testimony, some of the beginning stages of what God did in my life, and how he delivered me from darkness into light. And so Moment in the Word is a little bit deeper for those that really want to enhance their relationship with Christ. So that is why I do it. Uh, I do two separate playlists in this one YouTube channel. Maybe in the future, if the YouTube channel gets big enough, I can split it off into two separate channels. But right now, there's only so many subscribers, so I just keep it on one channel. It just makes it easier. Um, but I do break it down into playlists, Real Gospel for Real People and also Moment in the Word. And so, again, as I mentioned, the Moment in the Word, this is to take people a little bit deeper. And, you know, it's been coming to my attention that there are some people that we we get caught into. We want to get something from God's Word, but we seem to be just going through this monotonous practice of just reading it every day and not really gleaning anything. And so I want to touch on something. And first of all, let me pull this up. I got many tabs open in my uh, my thing, so I'm just going to pull it up as I talk to you. All right. All right, so the first scripture that I wanted to really kind of talk about was John 14, 26, because in order to get into um, studying the Bible and really getting something from it, because there are different methods and practices, but for me, um, just as a disclaimer, I don't get anything from the inductive Bible study or these, these Bible studies where you just really like pick apart with your human reasoning and intellect and and dive in and while it's all fine and well you can you can learn a lot about the bible itself and sometimes that's necessary um, but what i found for me personally i went through school where they tried to teach you how to study the bible i never got anything from that um, i learned early on in my christian walk before i ever entered a christian university um, and and i was taught by the holy spirit and that's what i want to highlight is learning how to rely on the Holy Spirit. I think today in this generation that we're in, we have so many different modern practices and methods that everybody's saying, well, you can study the Bible this way, study it this way, do it like this, do it like that. And while there's some things in those that I would probably condone to and actually may even practice in my life, I didn't get them from these modern day scholars, so to speak. And so I really like the beauty of, um, and I, <laughs> I, as I speak, I start remembering scripture and God just starts bringing it to my attention. Um, there was a place in the book of Acts and, and it really, it really, um, it meant something to me early on in my journey. And I want to share that. 
Um, and it was basically this, that the early disciples, they had this, this, you know, they were a ragtag bunch of people. And God chose the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And he, he chose fishermen and broken people. And, and these broken people turned the world upside down with their knowledge of God. And that is the beauty of the gospel. And that's something I wanted to highlight here is that there was a point in time where they were, they were uh, being scrutinized by the religious leaders. And they said, you know, you know, we see that these are just common, ordinary men. But yet it appears that Jesus has been with them. And that's something that I took away early on in my faith. And I just wanted to share that with you, my brothers and sisters, because that is probably the single most important part is that is Jesus with us? Because we can know everything the scriptures have to say and Jesus can still not be with us. And so that's something that I took away. And Paul even reiterates this many times over um, because he was he studied under Gamaliel. And he was he was so knowledge he was a knowledgeable Pharisee before he came to Christ. He knew the law in and out. He was he was a noted scholar, but yet he counted all these things as loss. Now, when he came to Christ, when he came to faith in Christ, he realized that his righteousness couldn't be earned through the things he was practicing, but rather through what Christ did and accomplished on the cross. And through that, embodies now the Holy Spirit within him, and he's able to learn and grow in that. And so for that, the scripture is John 14. 26. And I want to pull that up right now. And this is, again, using BibleHub.com. Great resource. We're talking about how I study the Bible. I go here a lot because it's easy to use, but, but I started out just with a Bible, just with a King James Bible, went on to different translations. Then I got multiple translations and put them side by side. And I did that before I ever even used the internet to study the Bible. So I just look at this as a, a great opportunity because everything's condensed in one site and easy to use. And so John 14, 26 is Jesus speaking about the promise of the Father, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit to those who would believe on Christ for their salvation. And he says this in the New Living Translation, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Just meditate on that and let this be a starting point for how I study the Bible. And so why do I start off with this? Well, because it's important to have your roots and your foundation laid, which is Jesus Christ. But when you lay that foundation, that first building block is the power of the Holy Spirit in a believer's lives. You see, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God but that which is born of the Spirit. And so those that are born of the Spirit have the promise of the Father that the Holy Spirit will teach us all things, guide us into all truth, and he will also bring to remembrance everything that Jesus has said. So the context here is the, is the, the, the apostles that were there with Jesus, walking with him for three years. Jesus said, I'm about to leave, but I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to give you the promise of the Holy Spirit and he's the one that's going to guide you throughout the rest of your life. And he's going to remind you of all these amazing things that I've taught you. And so that wasn't just exclusive to the apostles. That is for all believers everywhere. It is the foundation of our faith that we don't have to be scholars of God's word. We don't have to be elite. We just have to be common, ordinary men and women of God who choose to love Jesus Christ and be led by his spirit. And so if you're wondering what that looks like, it's actually really simple. It's just praying and asking. You know, and, and I think there's another scripture that comes to my mind. About giving the Holy Spirit. And it comes from Luke 11, 13. And I'm going to go ahead and pull that up here real quick as well. So here Jesus is saying about, and let me pull up the whole chapter in the English Standard Version just to kind of give us some context here. Jesus says here, starting at verse 5, and he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go out at, to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. 
and he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There it is. It's a gift given by God to people who believe in Jesus Christ who ask. Now, you might say, yeah, but I'm a believer and, I, and, and the Holy Spirit's given at the new birth, at being born again. And while that's true, you know, there's many other situations in the book of Acts where some people got it immediately and some people got a portion of it and needed a fuller filling later on. Um, you look at the early church and the apostles when they were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they were there praying because Jesus told them to wait in the city of Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. After Jesus ascended, he commanded them that you're going to go and make disciples. But he first commanded them that before you do that, you have to go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Jesus never described what that would look like for them on an individual basis. It was one of those things, you'll know it if you got it. And so, if you don't know it, you may not have it. And so, if you don't have it, don't be ashamed. Here it is. God has given a prescription to receiving it. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open. But I tell you the truth. It must be received by faith. And there's another scripture for that. Hebrews 11.6. This is one of my favorite scriptures. I say that a lot probably because the word of God is just so amazing. And so in Hebrews 11.6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Again, let that sink in. Without faith, brothers and sisters, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who really wants to draw near to God, who wants to hear from God, who wants to understand his word, who wants to apply the word to their life, must believe that God exists and he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Another translation says that he is a rewarder of those who sincerely seek him, who diligently seek him, earnestly seek him. All of these, so it's a diligence that we apply to our faith, that we ask, we seek, and we knock. And there are so many other examples. And one other example I want to encourage you in, if you're having troubles understanding um, God's word, know that as everything that I've mentioned thus far, and, and coupled with it being faith, without faith being impossible to please God, that when you hunger and thirst, Jesus said this, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so it's an important aspect of, of, of the integrity of the scriptures to understand what faith looks like in practice. Those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness can have everything else being added to them. It's a weird economy in God's in God's God's world. And so what we think of is, well, I've got to apply all this human exertion and I've got to get in here and do this and I've got to learn this and I've got to do that. No, what we've got to do is learn to rely and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that he can teach us. And oftentimes what he does is while we're seeking him in faith, earnestly, sincerely seeking God, knocking, asking, seeking, that the Holy Spirit begins to use our own life that we're walking through as examples on how to apply the scriptures. Now, I said the key word, apply the scriptures. If you're wanting to hear from God more, if you are wanting to understand the scriptures more, you've got to use what you know about it. And this is actually another, another biblical principle that is really simple to apply. And it comes from James 1.22. James 1.22 is a very common passage of scripture in it, and I've got several translations open right now, and it reads this. New International Version here says it as, 
Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Hmm. English Standard Version. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That's right. So Jesus is the foundation. He has given us the promise of the Father. If you don't experience him in your life, you can ask, you can seek, you can knock and ask. Be like, Lord, I just want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just like your apostles were on the day of Pentecost. And there's many other stories after that when you read through the book of Acts. Some people received it, you know, um, some people receive the Holy Spirit even in today but by water baptism. And some people receive it. For me, I received it before I was water baptized. I wasn't water baptized till a year and a half after I was born again. I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was given to me the moment I accepted Christ. Six months later, I received the fullness of the Spirit. I sought a second experience with God. And I, I say second experience, it's really not. It's just It just depends on when you experience it. Um, there's so many other illustrations and, and, and examples I could give you, but I like to share my own life with you and not so that you can look at me and say, well, this person's godly because I don't, I don't think of myself that way. And I would hope that you don't put me on a pedestal either. And I'm not saying these things because I want any focus on me. I just want to, my heart is to encourage the saints, is to build them up, is to edify them to truly understand God and his word and apply it to their lives. And so, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. It's out. So early on in my walk, I was learning to hear the voice of God. This is very important. And the voice of God comes through the leading of his Holy Spirit. It can come in a, in a thought, a nudge. And so for me, it was these thoughts and these nudges that were contrary to the way I used to think. And so all of a sudden, you know, I used to think all I used to think about was, you know, whatever I set my mind on. But then after becoming born again and really accepting Christ as my Savior, I began to hunger for God's Word, as many of you listening right now are in fact doing. And many of you are are following through on that hunger and are, are feeding upon God's Word and are doing God's Word and are growing because you're doing God's Word. You see, when you do God's Word, it's, it's like the parable of the talents, which I'll get into, is that when you use what God gave you, God multiplies that towards you. And so that's a biblical principle that you can apply. When you do God's word and are led by the Holy Spirit, God will begin to multiply that. When you begin to do in obedience what the Holy Spirit's leading you to do, and he'll lead you to do it through the reading and study of Scripture. And so you could read something and be like, oh man, like I just feel convicted in my heart that maybe I need to be doing that. And so then at that point, what you do, it's necessary, is stop, ask, seek, knock, and say, God, are you trying to show me something here? Prayer is essential to getting revelation from God's word. It is absolutely necessary. So when you approach God's word, the first thing should be, after you have your foundation built, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit, you want to pray before you read. You want to open your heart and your eyes and speak to God, but learn to sit in front of the word and listen to God as well. You see, I didn't learn all this stuff about scripture by by scrutinizing the scripture in a in a in in an intellectual way or a... a, a a scholarly way. I learned scriptures by doing the word of God. And then sometimes God would just give me knowledge of the scriptures just to feed me. And, and that was food to my soul. And understand that it is like manna from heaven that the children of Israel ate in the wilderness. That's Jesus to us. And that's what he does when he reveals his word. And so all these different examples, stop and pray before getting into the word and believe have faith. Remember, without faith, it is impossible to please him. And so if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be filled. If you are sincere in your relationship with God and you want to hear God's word, you will be filled. Now, is it instantaneous? No. Some of the lessons I learned in scripture took weeks and months. Some of them just took a day. But when you begin to walk out the scriptures in your life, God orders your steps in such a way to learn and to grow. And so always be aware. And this is a lifelong pursuit. This isn't something that happens overnight. The process is lifelong. We continually learn God's word and do God's word. And then we begin to grow and understand God's word. I don't ever want to have a head filled with biblical knowledge and not apply it to my life. That is not what I want for any of you either. And so to the parable of the talents, this was one of the first real revelations that God gave me of his word. And this was integral in my pursuit of growth. 
and other such areas when I mentioned coming into the scriptures with prayer. Um, one of the key situations before I get into the parable of the talents, and I want to pull this up, is the apostolic prayers. Um, I had a wonderful chaplain in prison that would tell me about the apostolic prayers and other people that that every once in a while you'd hear about it. And so I began to study the apostolic prayers. Apostolic prayers are simply prayers like the Apostle Paul praying for the church at Ephesus, and he writes it in his letters. And so one of these prayers is really, really powerful, and it really ministered to me in a huge way early on in my Christian journey. Again, we're talking about how I study the Word. This is how I study the Word. And so I remember hearing somebody minister this, but it wasn't just hearing their voice. It was a conviction that was laid on my heart. And so I talked about learning to discern the voice of God. Sometimes it comes in a conviction or a pressing in your heart, and you just know that you have to follow through with it. And sometimes it's even more subtle than that, where you can miss it if you're not paying attention. Sometimes God is speaking to us and we're not listening. And so it's important to develop a habit of listening to God through the leading of his Holy Spirit. And by doing that, you become doers of his word and not just hearers only. And then also God begins to multiply his word towards you. You see, when you feed, when you have two animals and you only feed one, that one's going to grow. And how do we feed the inner man, the, the, the new man that's inside of us, born of God's spirit? By, by chewing on God's word and doing what it says through his leading. At first, you might just get a nudge every once in a while. But I guarantee you, if you, through faith, follow that nudge, and sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And don't be discouraged. You see, Satan loves to discourage God's people from ever following his voice. Because sometimes we misconstrue what God's saying because of our own zeal or passion or desires. And so it's through that, that that God is even growing us even more because he's crucifying our flesh in the way that we desire things. And so I've made many mistakes in hearing God. I've prayed for people I thought God wanted me to pray for and, and, and failed. And, and, you know, it, it, it was in those moments that brought me back to God to pray and ask, but, but God, why? What happened here? Be honest and open. And don't be ashamed. Don't let the devil ashamed you for missing the mark on those things. It's when you have a habitual pattern of coming back to God and saying, you know what, God, I, I think I messed up here. Can you show me how to do this? And that's the beautiful thing is that God will pour himself out upon you. Back to the apostolic prayers. This is key because this is what helped um, initiate these promptings in my life to hunger for God's word in a deeper way. And so there is um, prayers that, that Paul prayed, and I want to go to that in Ephesians 1, but I'm scrolling through to get to it so I can drop it on the screen for you. There we go. All right, and here it is, Ephesians 1, chapter, f Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. It's kind of lengthy, but I would encourage you to go through the book of Ephesians, Colossians, and Philippians and look for areas where Paul prayed for things. Paul prayed had like three different, two prayers in Ephesians, and one in chapter 1 and one in chapter 3, about halfway through each chapter. And then at the end in chapter 6, Paul asked for prayer that he would be able to proclaim God's word boldly. And so when you look at this, then you can understand God's heart through God's people that are in this, in, in, in the Bible, that you can understand what God desires out of our prayer life. You see, sometimes we just pray for things we want, but if we start aligning our prayer life with things God wants through reading of his scripture in doing, so doing the word, then we will be blessed in our doing. And so Paul's prayer here is awesome and amazing, and that's why I want to focus on this one. It's something I would read daily and pray on and meditate on and ask God to make a reality, but have faith that he would do it because I'm sincerely seeking him. Paul says, verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I'm going to pause right there. That is a big part of this prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you 
the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Who's him? Christ. And so important key prayer is to pray that you would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Then you can read God's word and hear God speaking to you through it. This is so important. And then having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. In other words, having the, the, your hearts, the eyes of your heart open. So that, what does that mean? So that you can be able to see things in a spiritual way. So having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable, li listen to this now, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Back in the beginning of this video, I was talking about the promise of the Father, how he, the Spirit of God is going to teach us all things and bring to remembrance everything that God has said to us. He's going to guide us into all truth. He's also going to bring power into our lives to make us new, and that power is, is going to continuously make us new and sanctify us and give us revelation and give us understanding. So a, another key point to meditate on. And what is the immeasurable greatness? Imagine that. Here's two massive words. It's immeasurable and it's great. His power toward us who believe, but we have to believe. The same power, here's another key, the same power says that he worked, or rather it says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? And then according to the working of his great might, which is great power, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. I'm going to stop there and talk about that. That same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you can have faith that God can do anything and nothing is impossible with him, then you too can have this massive growth in the scriptures. It's simple faith. It's not that 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 you have to study more than anyone else. It's not that you have to to, and I speak on human terms, it's not that you have to go to school to learn the scriptures. You have the greatest teacher of all, and that is the Holy Spirit. And so it's important to understand that the power of the Holy Spirit that can teach you, it's the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. So he's able to give new life to you and I when we sincerely, diligently seek him through faith. Learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. That is the keyest of all keys you could ever learn from this whole teaching is develop a habit of being led by God's spirit. Then you can pray and pray these prayers. And when I say pray these prayers, it doesn't mean that you're all of a sudden instantly, the moment you pray this prayer, going to realize that, oh, hey, you know, oh, I feel this prayer working. Some may, some may not. I didn't. It took a couple weeks before I of praying this prayer every day where I look back and God started bringing situations into my life where I was able to minister to people through what he had been giving me in his word. And so I was getting stuff from his word, but I was also doing it, something with what he gave me. And so he kept giving me more and more and more. And again, the parable of the talents, which we'll get to. And so by doing that, I looked back and I saw all these times that God had used me to minister to people in ways that were beyond my own comprehension. And so then I knew God was answering this prayer. And so be diligent in your pursuit of God. Have faith, trust in him, lean on his Holy Spirit and not on your own understanding and continue to be diligent, be consistent. I put out a, a, a video called Persistent Consistency. Be consistent. Continue to try to hit the target. Sometimes you got to climb up a ladder just to get to the target. But when you have a habit of doing that, you start to develop an understanding of when God speaks and you're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes, but we're going to pick ourselves back up and continue forward and learn from those mistakes to better hear God because we're going to need it in the days to come. All believers that truly believe in Jesus Christ have been given the promise of the father. Some of us may have to ask for a fullness of his spirit. Some of us may have got it at baptism, as I mentioned earlier, or in various other ways. There's many other situations in the book of Acts that talk about all the different variety of ways that God poured out his spirit on his people. Some people received the baptism and weren't poured, had the Holy Spirit poured out on them. But later on, the apostles came and laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. 
Be open to how God wants to give it to you. When you ask God for something, but believe you're receiving it and you shall have it. That's the importance. But it doesn't mean I can just believe in whatever I ask for. As I mentioned, we come to God's word to see what we should be praying for. That is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God has already promised to provide everything else we need. Doesn't mean we don't offer prayers for things we need in this life. It just means that if our sole focus, our pri the, the priority of our focus, our main focus is on God and his word and, and following the desires of his heart, he'll take care of us on the back end. That's his promise. And so moving forward to this first real revelation that I got from God's word, obviously I was already saved. I was being, I was learning how to be led by God's spirit. I was putting his word before me every day. I wasn't always getting something from it. And that's another disclaimer. You you may go leaps and bounds. And then you may have a season where you're just, it's it seems like it's dry. That's okay. Stay persistent. Stay, stay consistent. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He sees everything and he will reward in his time, not our own. And so remember that. So moving on to Matthew 25. I am not going to read the entirety of this chapter, but I will just go over it. It starts in Matthew 25, verses 14, all the way to 30. And so the gist of it, and I'll just pull it up so you can look at it. The gist of it is that there was people that were given talents. To one he gave five talents. To one, uh, he gave five talents to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Really quick, God gives according, not just your ability, but the ability he graced you with. And so remember that we're not always trying to be like someone else. I wouldn't want everyone here to be like me, but we can all learn from each other and grow from each other and grow in our individual relationship with God through what God's doing in our lives. And that's why I'm so passionate about sharing these things. But here, one person was given five talents, one person was given two, and one person was given one. Talents in this specific situation, um, it's a parable. So Jesus was using a natural illustration of something that actually happens to relay a spiritual truth. Understand that, that that's what a parable is. And so Jesus was given this real life situation of somebody given um, a large amount of, of money, pretty much. And he's saying, so one person was given five talents of maybe gold or silver, which is a large sum. Uh, one person was given two talents and another person was just given one, each according to their own ability, according to the grace that God assigned to their life, God had given that to them. And so one person, it says, he who had received the five, it says that he went at once and traded with them and he made five talents more. And so also the one who had made, who had the two talents, he made two talents more. So these two people, one had five, one had two, they were using what God had given them. And so then there was the one who had one talent. It says that this person that had one talent, he went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. And then it says after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. The person who received five, the person who received two, they brought their stuff before the master and said, hey, look at what I did. I went and I made profit and, and used what you gave me. And so here it is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out here trading. I'm out here doing what I need to do to provide, to, to, to show, you know, honor and integrity. And here it is. But then, you know, the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. But then there's the one that came forward who had the one, and he didn't receive a good, a good, a good message. This guy said he also who had received, let me see here. The one talent came forward saying, master, I knew you had to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. You know, I'm going to pause. Many people are afraid to use what God has given them. Many people are afraid to be led by the Spirit. They're afraid that, that, that they know God might lead them into a situation they don't want to be in. Well, that's sin. That's just sin. And so 
you know, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When you humble yourself and you're broken, you say, you know what, I'm probably, I, I might make mistakes, but I'm going to go forward because God's telling me to go forward. You got to go. You may not know what it's going to look like, but you got to obey God. And so when you do God's word, God can multiply. And so this is really interesting here. And so the summary of this, I'm going to read this entire summary here. I'm starting at verse 27. It says, Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So then take the talent from him who and give it to him who has ten talents. Now, mind you, the person who has ten talents was the one who was given five and made five more. And so the master is saying here, you know, take the talent from the one who squandered away, who refused to use what I gave him, and give it to the person who has ten. So reward the person who is doing something with what I gave them. And this is the key part that I wanted everybody to understand here. Four, to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Think about this. For everyone who has, what is he saying? Just because you have more talents than another person that you're better than the other person? No. It's so we're, what we're talking about here is a spiritual parallel of the gifts, the gifting and the sets that God gives us, um, the abilities that God gives us. And so just because we have more doesn't make us more in God's eyes or more to another person. Actually, we're all on the same playing field. It's about using what you have been given. And that's what he's saying here. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and then he will have an abundance. So the principle here is if you have what God has given you and you use what God has given you, he will then give you more. And so that applies with you know, tithing even. It applies with every aspect of our lives. But what is given back in abundance is not on our timetable. It's not according to our own desires. It's according to God, who is the maker and creator of all things, to whom we submit our lives to. But the importance here of being sowers and reapers is really beautiful because it's about following the will of God and not our own. So if God gives us something, it doesn't put us on a higher or lower playing field than the next person who may only have the two talents as opposed to the five. But when you use what God has given you, God can then give you more. And so the one who has, more will be given. And so that was the principle. When, you, when I say be doers of the word and not hearers only, this idea comes in and that when you start to use what God has given you, he can then multiply it. And so I'll give you the real life illustration for me because this was the first real revelation I got from God. And so I looked at this and it was like, as I was reading this, I knew in my heart the meaning of it, but I also knew in my heart what God was requiring of, requiring of me at that moment in my life. He said, I have given you something and I want you to go share it. And he says, right now, I've given you understanding of this passage of scripture. Now go and share it. See, we're called to go make disciples. Each and every believer, no matter how many gifts you have, no matter where God has placed you in life, there's somebody always to share with. It doesn't mean you have to share every second of every day. Right now, I'm sharing in this video. Sometimes I get to share in person. Some other times I get to, well, a lot of times I get to share in person. It's, it's a constant thing. But in the beginning, this was the first thing God ever gave me to share. And this was all I had. And so it was really the only real solid understanding of scripture that I had on doing God's word. And so at that moment, I knew in my heart I had to share it. And then God pointed out somebody and I was in prison and there was a guy and he was over there standing by his bunk and God's like, go share that with him. And I was like, oh, I can't do that. Who am I? You know, I'm just nobody. I don't understand the Bible like everyone else. And all I understand is this. But yet that was a talent that God gave me. And so I did have fear. I had trepidation, but I recognized there was a conviction laid in my heart that was contrary to the way I used to think. And I said, man, this has got to be God. And so I followed through with it. And I went to this person and I said, hey, can I share something with you? And he said, yeah, OK. And he stopped what he was doing. And I said, hey, can I, I'm going to read this scripture and then we'll talk about it. You know, and I shared the meaning God gave me. I said, so it's important to use what God gave you. And that's pretty much the message I shared with him. And then when I went back and this was so amazing, God showed me this in a very short period of time. 
and it built my faith so that I could endure the longer periods of time without receiving um, understanding of God's word. But I tell you the truth, as soon as I went back to my own bunk, I opened up the Bible and I began to pray and thank God because I could feel this joy welling up inside of me that God was using me and God was leading me by his spirit. And I understood that, you know, I went back to the scripture and then I understood that if I share what God gave me, God will give me more. And I tell you the truth, from that moment on, the Bible started opening up to me even more. But it was like peeling back the layers of an onion. I began to understand little bit by little bit by little bit, but every little bit I understood, I tried to find a unique and creative way to share it. And it didn't have to be this bold affront of, hey, let me, let me share this message with you. Sometimes it could just be writing something down. I started journaling from that point on and, and writing down revelations. I actually have folders still here today from those days that I, sometimes I reflect back on. And sometimes I'm actually able to use them years later to share with people. And so it's amazing. <clears throat> it's like a treasure house that God gives you. And so rather than just having to run out and share it immediately, I started to just hold it and then share it when God would lead me to share it. And so I began to learn how to hear God's voice and grow in it. And since I was being a doer of God's word and not a hearer, I wasn't deceiving myself and I was also preparing myself to receive more. And that's really how I study God's word. I don't use these, um, these other methods and these other practices. And while I probably, you know, use some of the practices within some of those uh, major uh, teaching structures, I don't generally, um, I, I, I not say generally, I don't at all apply the, the, the grand scheme of those. I don't utilize that type of Bible study. But as I started to study the Bible this way, God would lead me through his word and it began to make more sense. And then he began to give me understanding to the point where I could write books and teachings and the teachings started getting longer and more detailed and, and, and it happened over time. It was a progression. And so it wasn't all of a sudden that I was able to write a book. I had to go through certain things to be able to learn and to be able to grow in those things to be able to articulate it even better. And so even the speech, the speaking part, all of this stuff is by being led by the spirit. So again, the title of the, the video is How I Study the Word. And so if you really want to understand the desires of God's heart and how he places his word on high, I would suggest reading Psalm 119. It is the longest psalm, maybe the longest chapter in the entire book of the Bible, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's built into poetry. And so, which brings me into another point, but I want to finish this one. Psalm 119 has some amazing, amazing verses in it, one of which is, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And the entire chapter is broken up into stanzas here. And you can see there's eight verses. There's another eight. There's another eight. And so it's poetry. Um, and when you read through these things, there's so many beautiful passages. And it shows how God holds his word dear and how his word is exalted. And he says here in verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's really what it's all about. Storing up God's word in our heart, being obedient to the nudgings and the leadings and the convictions of the Holy Spirit because he will teach us all things and guide us into all truth. And again, this is how I study the word. I let God teach me. And so it's just that simple. And I think sometimes things can be so simple that we miss them. I know there are times in my life that I've go through seasons where I'm just not getting anything from God's word. Even, even this past year, 2022, has been a really dry season for me. But yet God would still give me his word and, and I would, you know, when he would lead me, I would put a video up. I felt led to do this video. I felt led to do every video I've done. And I only want to do them if I'm being led. There was a couple months where God led me away from it. And there may be a couple months again in the future. And so... But I was focused on other aspects and other avenues of bringing God's word to other people because that's what's important to me. But just as important as sharing God's word is also being filled with God's word. And sometimes you have to take those seasons of dryness, of just uh, constant discipline and, and persistent consistency in those things to keep your face in the word, to keep your face in prayer. Don't ever give up. Don't ever lose heart. Don't grow weary while doing good for in due season you will reap if you do not give up. That's the key though, if you do not give up. We don't wanna lose ground, we wanna gain ground. 
And so that is kind of the purpose of why I shared this video is because I know that there may be some out there that, that are, are, are grappling with how do, I, how do I get revelation from the scriptures? And for me, that's how it works best. And through that, taught me principles that are in such methods like inductive Bible study methods. But I've never gotten anything from having to go through the inductive Bible study method. It actually confuses me, which is kind of strange to share. But again, I know that I'm an uneducated common man, but it appears that I know Jesus is with me. And so that's all that matters to me, is that I can share and bring God's truth to whoever he sends me to through his leading, so that at the end of the day, we can't say, well, you know, I did this of my own strength. But such methods inside of the inductive Bible study method are not all wrong. And so I want to make that disclaimer. Um, there are certain um, understandings, for example, that I have gleaned throughout my life of walking with the Lord that I found maybe um, traces of inside of the inductive Bible study method. Um, but the problem that I have with the inductive Bible study method, as, again, as another disclaimer, is that it focuses too much on human reasoning and intellect than it does on being led by God's spirit. Now, I'm not an enemy of intellect or reason. I'm just saying, like, if you really want revelation, you need to rely on God and not just human methods. Um, tradition has its place. Uh, practices have their place. But if you solely rely on those things, you'll find your your own faith walk dwindling because you're you're not you're 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 not being led by God. And that's the whole like that's the whole hallmark of the Christian faith is being led by God is experiencing God. And it doesn't mean that I, you know, get to have those woohoo moments every moment of every day. It just means that that you you develop an ability to discern God's voice. And so that's what's really important because he is the helper. And when you think about it, when you have the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of God himself, wanting and desiring to teach you, who would I be then to say, you know what, I want to practice this method instead? But as it is, when you start to study the Bible, you start to understand basic literature reading is you want to understand when you go pick up a chapter book, maybe you pick up, I, I use Stephen King, not recommending Stephen King by any means, but my dad used to love reading Stephen King. Well, you know the genre of the book, and so that gives you the ability to understand where the writer is going to go with things because you understand it's you know more of a sci-fi, you know thriller type of book, and you understand that that it's 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 not real. This is where he's going with it. And then you start to understand how the writer writes, and that gives you a better understanding into what he's writing. And so basic principles of when I'm reading the scriptures it's really, it's kind of comes back down to common sense, but sometimes we, we don't see it that way. When I read, for example, the epistles, the word epistle is letter. It was literally a letter that was written by one person to another group or a group of people to another group or one person to one person. And so when I read, for example, the book of Ephesians, it's really important to understand that it's right in the beginning. It says, and I'll go back to it here. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, here's his introduction. So the book of Ephesians starts out by Paul say, saying, I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. And who is it to? To the saints who are in Ephesus who are faithful in Christ. So it's a letter written to Christians in the city of Ephesus. And so it's important to understand that when I'm reading this, it's different than when I'm reading this. And it's also different when I'm reading something like this. Exodus was not a letter. In fact, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, all these books, these were um, known as the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They were all written by Moses. So we understand they're written by Moses. The who is there. Why was it written? It's kind of like it's, it's well, it is known as the law, but it also gives a historical account of creation. It gives a historical account of the first covenants of God with people and how he brought, brought or called and brought a people out to a place to make them a people for his name and for his glory and for his renown. Then you get into kings and chronicles, and that's a historical account of the kings, the chronicles of the kings of the nation of Israel. And then after Israel split, it was the chronicles of the kings of Israel and Judah. 
And then you understand that these are different types of literature. They're different genres, if you will. And then you can understand a little bit better how to read them. And so going forward, you have books like Proverbs. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It's just a, a literature book filled with wisdom. And it's important to understand that when reading that, it's different than if I was to read an intimate letter from Paul to the church at Ephesus. So you can kind of see the difference. Then you get into books like Isaiah, Micah, Malachi. You get major prophets and minor prophets, Jeremiah. And you can understand that the Bible isn't put together in a chronological way, but you can get ones that are. And so it's important when you are endeavoring into the Bible that you're going to start to understand a little bit different of context. And that brings me to the next thing. While studying the Bible, God has taught me to look around the passages of Scripture. And it's amazing that what can happen is that God can open up things as you start to read. That when I read, you know, um, in Ephesians, for example, if I just read, you know, one verse, I have to understand that the verses and the chapters were never separated. When it was first written, it was just a letter all written together and sent, um, maybe even on a scroll or a parchment. And so and then was delivered to the people and they just read it. And so it's important that you can just read through things. And there's other times when you need to stop and meditate on it. And it's also good to have a good devotional by a good teacher or, or you know, but it's Im important not to just rely on that devotional material, but go to the scripture that that material is from and not just reading through the Bible in one year, because that's important too, but that's a different type of reading. That's just getting through it. And so you also want to stop and look all around, say, you know, say we looked at verse three of Ephesians. Well, then if the devotional was about verse three of Ephesians and somebody gave a little mini teaching, well, then I want to go to Ephesians um, verse three of chapter one, and I want to read the rest of the chapter just to see what was being said beyond just that one passage of scripture. So all these things are necessary and important, but the key of all of this is to be led by the spirit. I would rather you be led by the spirit into these things than to fixate on a, a, a tradition or a method or a practice that could potentially replace the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's kind of what I'm geared towards. Not saying that it will or it won't, but anything in this world has the potential to. And so if you're going to use those other methods, then that's fine. But just make sure that you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit through it. And so that way God can get the glory and you can get as much as you can out of it. Well, I hope that this video has helped you. It's been almost an hour now. And so I just, I probably need to get off of this. And I wanted to try to make it as condensed yet exhaustive as possible. And so I hope that somehow, some way that this has added value to you. If it has, hit the like, hit the subscribe. Let's kick up the YouTube algorithm so that more people can see these videos. And, and the subscribe so you can be notified of future videos if you are getting value from these. Um, share these, you know, share them on social media, wherever you are. I'm not trying to self-promote. I'm just trying to get the message out there so that more people can understand Jesus Christ and grow in him so that we can all become doers of his word and not just hearers only. Before I leave, I will send you out with the Lord's blessing. So Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would just bless every viewer, that you would keep them that you would make your face shine upon them, Lord, that you would lift your countenance upon them, that you would give them peace, Lord. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We love you.